live from downtown Traverse City by the shore of Lake Michigan. This is the National Writer Series. Located in the lower northwestern part of the state, the region has a robust arts culture, beautiful scenery, and, of course, dedicated book lovers. Hosting more than 250 authors in 14 years, NWS recently welcomed best-selling novelists Geraldine Brooks, Ann Patchett, and Bitch Album. The National Writers Series couldn't do this without our amazing audience and talented authors. I love NWS! Please welcome National Writers Series co-founder Doug Stanton, a number one New York Times best-selling author, and NWS Marketing Director Noel Riley to introduce tonight's event. Am I going? Yeah. Good evening, everyone. I know you're in the lobby still eating those free cookies. Scarf them down. Come on in. We've got quite a show for you tonight here at the City Opera House in Traverse City, Michigan. My name is Doug Stanton. Uh, we're a year-round book festival. I'm so glad to be here with uh, Noelle Riley, um, our marketing director, and um, you just saw her on stage, on, on the screen. This event is, is being presented tonight with the support of Lola Jackson and Dillis Tostin Garcia Community Building Author Conversations. A big round of applause for those two. They have been and are really ardent and wonderful supporters. We're so grateful. We met last July at our gala and um, it's, it's, it's a fun uh, acquaintanceship and partnership. Um, we're also uh, uh, have a literary sponsor tonight who's a generous friend of NWS who wishes to remain anonymous. It's not me. Um, and we are delighted that, uh, to host Kava Akbar, which is why you're here. His new book, The Martyr, is an instant New York Times bestseller. It's hit numerous best of lists in 2024 already, including Time, Oprah, CNN, and one of Sarah Jessica Parker's books of the year. There's much more to say about that. And it, uh, it also landed number two on the indie bestseller list, so that's awesome. We'd also like to thank the Michigan Arts and Culture Council and the National Endowment for the Arts. Proceeds from this event go to help pay for our free Raising Writers program for kids, including Battle of the Books. Speaking of, two weeks ago, NWS kicked off its Battle of the Books handout at Traverse Area District Library, and we have a short video for you. We are here at the Traverse Area District Library with the Battle of the Books handout. What that means is we have 53 teams of almost 400 fourth and fifth graders coming through this library to pick up eight books per team that they have to read between now and April when we have our Battle of the Books competition. Tell everybody what the name of your team is. Reputation Readers! I am really excited for the main battle because I really love doing it. We're going to try to read as many books as we can, so we don't really know what place we're going to get in, but we're going to try our best. Yay! I'll tell you what, we've got a lot of great teams coming through this library. Tell me, why are you excited about Battle of the Books? Because I did it last year and it was pretty entertaining. Very exciting because we read books and we talk about it. What was it like when last year when you did Battle of the Books? It was exciting and it was bigger than I thought it'd be. Eight books, we can do it! Yeah! In April, we have an author coming and the author is Chris Gaberstein. It is actually this book, Home Sweet Motel, is one of the books that they get to read. And every year, Battle of the Books has an author of one of the books that we give that gets to talk to the kids. Okay, we'll be back in April, and we're gonna have the teams and all of the coverage of them competing, and the winner, and the author, and we are so excited for you to see it. Check out our website, nationalwriterseries.com, and Battle of the Books is so possible because of your support. I'm so excited to read the books. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> those kids, so fun, so much energy. And thanks to everyone who volunteered and donated money, making it a free program to area fourth and fifth graders. That was a fantastic video, Noel. thank you so much. Um, um, thank you to Horizon Books, our sponsors, our volunteers, you've seen m many of their names on the screen as you were s uh, seating yourself, and our incredible donors, you'll find in the new program guide, which has just come out. 
We also like to thank our live stream audience tonight, which literally is global with its people tuning in from Panama. Who knows why, but we're glad to have them. All right. Um. Oh, wait, wait, no, no. Oh. Illinois, yeah. California, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, and a roadside cafeteria, I think, in Wyoming, if I'm not um, mistaken. Go right ahead. <laughs> Oh, you gotta love Wyoming. Okay, before we dive into introductions, I'd like to acknowledge that tonight's event is taking on place, taking place on lands cherished and maintained by the indigenous people of this area. We wish to recognize the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians and their land that we are gathered upon this evening. Now, we thank you, thank you. Now we'd like to introduce guest host Ari Mokdad and Kava Akbar. Ari Mokdad is a Detroit-born choreographer, creative writer, and a passionate educator. She received three Bachelor of Arts degrees from Grand Valley State University and a ba Master of Arts and doctor uh, Doctoral Studies at Wayne State University. Now, in 2023, she earned her Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing from Warren Wilson College, where Kava was her professor. She's also the education director for National Writer Series and does a fantastic job. She does. A big round of applause for Ari Mokdad, who also has a, a big, big hand in all the Raising Writer programs and also the Battle of the Books. So you'll, you'll meet her in just a moment. Something about Kava Akbar. He's the author, as you know, of the debut novel, Martyr, which has exploded onto the literary world. It was praised by John Green as, quote, brilliant and blisteringly alive. Tommy Orange, a future NWS guest as well, said he hasn't loved a book this much in years. Kava has previously published two books of poetry, Pilgrim Bell and Calling a Wolf a Wolf. He is also the author of a chapbook, Portrait of the Alcoholic, and is the editor, I found out today, of the Penguin Book of Spiritual Verse, 110 Poets on the Divine. He and his spouse, Paige Lewis, edited together another Last Call, Poems on Addiction and Deliverance, and you'll see how this keys into tonight's conversation. His writing appears in The New Yorker, PBS NewsHour, Paris Review, Best American Poetry, The New York Times, and elsewhere. Since 2020, Kava has served as poetry editor for The Nation. He was born in Tehran, Iran, and now teaches at the University of Iowa. All right, please welcome our guest host, Ari Mokdad, and author Kava Akbar to the National Writer Series stage. Hello, look at all of you. You filled in fast. It's beautiful. Um, I'm Kav Akbar. Uh, it's my luck to get to be here with you all. Uh, it is not lost on me that the opportunity cost of being at something like this is, you know, watching an hour of Stones in 1971 on YouTube or learning how to Julian and Onion or uh, Tango or what, like I like I think all the time about the opportunity cost of reading and doing literary sundries has never been greater. There's never been more things that you could be doing instead. So it always feels, uh, this sounds like a shtick, but it, truly it always feels like a sincere occasion for gratitude um, that people are choosing to spend time doing literature. And I mean, reading a 10 hour novel, you know, it's, it's, it's not lost on me, that gift. So thank you all for being here and thank you, Ari. I want to start off with asking if you'd read a little bit of your book, since this book is, you know, just out. I don't know if everyone's had a chance to read it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, people keep coming up to me and apologizing, saying, like, I'm only halfway through the book. I'm like, it just came out. Like, it does, it's not perishable. Um, it's, <laughs> there's lots of stuff to read. Um, uh, so yeah, yeah. Um, and Ari was my student. Ari was my grad student at Warren Wilson. And so this is like, yeah. So <laughs> this is a really cool uh, kind of uncanny full circle moment for us, I think. We were talking about that a little bit backstage. Um, yeah, I'm just going to read for a couple minutes uh, just the opening couple pages of the book. You don't need to know anything. 
um, just generally. Uh, 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 yeah, these are just the opening few pages of the book, and then Ari and I will talk to each other, and then we'll talk to each other, and then um, there will be opportunity if you want to sign your book, or if, if you want to sign your books. If you want me to sign your books, or um, if you'd like to air your recriminations to me privately, um, that will be... <laughs> That will be your opportunity to do so. So uh, I'm just going to read and then... Maybe it was that Cyrus had done the wrong drugs in the right order, or the right drugs in the wrong order. But when God finally spoke back to him after 27 years of silence, what Cyrus wanted more than anything else was a do-over. Clarification. Lying there on his mattress that smelled like piss and Febreze, in his bedroom that smelled like piss and Febreze, Cyrus stared up at the room's single light bulb, willing it to blink again, willing God to confirm that the bulb's flicker had been a divine action and not just the old apartment's trashy wiring. Flash it on and off, Cyrus had been thinking, not for the first time in his life. Just a little wink and I'll sell all my shit and buy a camel. I'll start over. All his shit at that moment amounted to a pile of soiled laundry and a stack of books borrowed from various libraries and never returned. Poetry and biographies, To the Lighthouse, My Uncle Napoleon. Never mind all that, though. Cyrus meant it. Why should the Prophet Muhammad get a whole visit from an archangel? Why should Saul get to see the literal light of heaven on the road to Damascus? Of course it would be easy to establish bedrock faith after such clear-cut revelation. How was it fair to celebrate those guys for faith that wasn't faith at all, that was just obedience to what they plainly observed to be true? And what sense did it make to punish the rest of humanity who had never been privy to such explicit revelation? to make everyone else lurch from crisis to crisis, desperately alone. But then it happened for Cyrus too, right there in that ratty Indiana bedroom. He asked God to reveal himself, herself, themself, itself, whatever. He asked with all the earnestness at his disposal, which was Trove's, if every relationship was a series of advances and retreats, Cyrus was almost never the retreater sharing everything important about himself in a word, a smile, with a shrug as if to say, those are just facts, why should I be ashamed? He'd lain there on the bare mattress on the hardwood floor, letting his cigarette ash on his bare stomach like some sulky prince, thinking, turn the lights on and off, Lord, and I'll buy a donkey, I promise, I'll buy a camel and ride him to Medina, to Gethsemane, wherever, just flash the lights and I'll figure it out, I promise. He was thinking this, and then it, something, happened. The light bulb flickered, or maybe it got brighter, like a camera's flash going off across the street, just a fraction of a fraction of a second like that. And then it was back to normal, just a regular yellow bulb. Cyrus tried to recount the drugs he'd done that day. The standard bouquet of booze, weed, cigarettes, clonopin, Adderall, Neurontin. He had a couple Percocets left, but he'd been saving them for later that evening. None of what he'd taken was exotic. Nothing that would make him out and out hallucinate. He felt pretty sober, in fact, relative to his baseline. He wondered if it had maybe been the sheer weight of his wanting or his watching that strained his eyes till they saw what they'd wanted to see. He wondered if maybe that was how God worked now in the new world. Tired of interventionist pyrotechnics like burning bushes and locust plagues, maybe God worked now through the tired eyes of drunk Iranians in the American Midwest, through CVS handles of bourbon and little pink pills with G31 written on their side. Cyrus took a pull from the giant plastic old crow bottle. The whiskey did, for him, what a bedside table did for normal people. It was always at the head of his mattress, holding what was essential to him in place. It lifted him daily from the same sleep it eventually set him into. 
Lying there, reflecting on the possible miracle he just experienced, Cyrus asked God to do it again. Confirmation, like typing your password in twice to a web browser. Surely if the all-knowing creator of the universe had wanted to reveal themselves to Cyrus, there'd be no ambiguity. Cyrus stared at the ceiling light, which in the fog of his cigarette smoke looked like a watery moon, and waited for it to happen again. But it didn't. Whatever sliver of a flicker he had or hadn't perceived didn't come back. And so, lying there in the stuffy haze of relative sobriety, itself a kind of high, amidst the underwear and cans and dried piss and empty orange pill bottles and half-read books held open against the hardwood, breaking their spines to face away, Cyrus had a decision to make. Thank you. It always helps to hear an author say the book to us in their voice. And I'm really curious about the leap from poetry to prose. Mm -hmm. Why did you choose this book to be prose? Yeah, yeah. So um, my first two books were poetry. I have thought of myself as a poet since I was 15. Um, I have loved poetry my whole life. I, you know, I lived in the 811.5 section of the library. Like, that was home for me, right? Um, and then I've had this story in my head for a long time. Um, in this book, there is a performance artist named Orchide who uh, is doing this sort of Marina Abramovich-esque artist's present performance of her own dying, right? Where she has a terminal cancer diagnosis and she spends the final weeks of her life dying in the Brooklyn Museum and people can sit across from her and have conversations with her about dying, right? Um, and I've had this idea in my head about that just sort of loosely, like wouldn't that be interesting if someone, you know? And I found that fiction was a way to sort of stick my hands in the sock puppets and, you know, make them talk to each other, right? So I could, I could enact that, right? I don't have to live it. I can just sort of play it out in this little metonymic diorama of real life, right? Um, and so I started writing these dialogues with her, and that led me to Cyrus, um, who is, you know, the, now the protagonist of the novel. Um, so it, be, it developed very organically. I'll say that um, writing poetry trained me to uh, wedge oracular bon mots up against each other and uh, sort of gnomic sounding wisdoms, right? Um, but it never prepared me for getting someone on a train or, you know, what someone does at an ATM or, you know, or, you know, how someone picks up the tab at a bar, right? Like, or um, what someone is doing with their feet while they talk, right? And, uh, or how people walk through doorways, right? All of this stuff, I had to sort of crash course myself in narrative art to try to put in here organically in a way that didn't feel like I was just cudgeling the reader with exposition. That stuff really was, my, my poetry isn't particularly narrative. And so I had never really, I've spent my life, you know, the majority of my life as a writer, but I'd never thought about doing those things. And so learning that was also kind of thrilling. It's like when I first started translating, it's like a whole new way to play my favorite game. Amazing. Did you find anything particularly useful as you were making that transition from poetry to prose? Was there any tools or best guides that you used? Yeah, so I, I visited a high school earlier and I was speaking with some of those students about this, so I apologize to you who, are, who was also there and I spoke about this a little bit, but um, yeah, I put myself on this narrative diet of uh, reading two novels a week and watching a movie a day just to sort of like super saturate myself in narrative art. And it wasn't like all high-minded, you know, I would watch an Antonioni film one day and a Bergman film one, the next day and then, you know, I'd watch Pineapple Express the third day, right? I just wanted to see how people got characters through the, the terminals of narrative, right? You know, how, how do you have, you know, how do you write a scene that signals the end of act one, right? And also, um, how do you, 
when I, would, when I would sense my attention waning, whether I was reading a book or watching a movie, when I would sense you know, me losing interest, I would especially n take note of what was happening in those moments and what wasn't happening in those moments, you know what I mean? Because this is a, it's a weird book, right? You know, there's long dialogues with Lisa Simpson and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Rumi and, you know, and um, it's, it's not a super conventional form, though it is a pretty conventional narrative. Uh, and so, the, the fun of doing that is just that it's weird and thrilling and I can sort of follow my eccentricities, but the danger of doing that is the reader gets bucked off the ride, right? You know, and so, um, and so learning to calibrate that was not a quick process. And then the other part of it, um, uh, Tommy Orange, who I heard mentioned in the intro, who will be coming here, I think, uh, when his book, Wandering Stars, is released, um, we trade pages every Friday. Um, that's my guy, you know, we trade. And so, uh, we, you know, I send him, I sent him pages throughout the process of writing this novel, and he sent me pages throughout the process of writing Wandering Stars, which is the sequel to his book, There, There, um, which comes out uh, just in a few weeks now and is extraordinary and is every bit as good as There, There, and um, you should all feel very excited. Um, but uh, so, so we traded pages, and this is, you know, I mean, Tommy Orange is like one of the, if, if there is a book, if, if there is a book, of American fiction written in the last 20 years that will still be being taught widely in 100, I would put my money on there, there. Um, and, so, and so, you know, me, a first time novelist sharing my pages with him could feel sometimes a little bit like showing my macaroni art to Michelangelo, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, like just being like that, ah, you know? But I also think that um, it forced me to sort of rise to the, you know what I mean? If I was really tired and it was Wednesday, you know, I couldn't, and we're trading pages on Friday, you know, I didn't want to just write a thousand sloppy words and be like, ah, I didn't have time this week, this isn't very, you know, I, I wanted to show up because, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm writing to my better, <laughs> you know what I mean, just frankly. And, and that, was, that was really good for me. I like, I like that sort of challenge. Yeah, the thing that stands out to me about Cyrus is in this book is that he has a really strong bond with Z. It brings community into place, and I'm just curious, how has community played a role, not just in your writing, but also in your recovery journey? Yeah, yeah, uh, so uh, a kind of multivalent question. Um, Cyrus is the book's protagonist, Z is his roommate, sometimes lover, sometimes just friend, um, and they sort of, a lot of the book orbits them as they move through the terminals of young adulthood. Um, uh, yeah, but your, your question itself was sort of bigger than that. Your question was how has community played a role in my literary life and then in my recovery life? I mean, in my recovery life, is I, I'm a person who is sober. This is not, it has like the texture of intimacy when I say it to a room full of strangers, but it's actually like among the least secret things about me. Like if you Googled me, there would be few things that would come up more quickly than the fact that I'm in recovery. Uh, like the fact that I'm 6'4 is like more surprising to people than the fact that I'm, uh, but, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm a person who is in recovery. Um, uh, I've been sober for 10 and a half years, and that entire experience is, <laughs> thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that. And that entire experience is predicated on the fellowship of other people who have been moving through these before me and who helped me when it could do them no good. Uh, to do so and who just gave of themselves and gave and gave and gave even when I was still Showing up to recovery meetings, you know drunk and slurring and just sort of sneering at everyone, you know, like There with this purely anthropological interest and in how screwed up all of these other people were, you know, and um, uh, And they would bum me smokes afterwards and tell me to keep coming back and you know, and so, you know, and and there is no any of the, you know, I wouldn't be sat here, I wouldn't be married to the love of my life, I wouldn't be teaching at Iowa, I, none of this would happen if it weren't for that fellowship, right? Um, everything is predicated on um, that program of recovery um, and the people that I found therein. Um, literarily, again, like, I mean, I wrote this book in weekly pages, I mean, Tommy's read this book 12 times over. Um, my spouse, who is an incredible transcendent American poet, Paige Lewis, uh, 
has read it over and over again. You know, um, I mean, com I, I came up with a group of poets uh, like Hanif Abdurraqib and Clint Smith and Nate Marshall and Fatima Asghar and Safia El Hilo and you know this group of poets who we always show up to each other's book launches and Angel Nafis and Angel uh, when I launched this book rented a car and just traveled around with me for the first leg of my tour. You know, and so. Um, you know, we, we came up together when none of us had books, right? And we've just always been there for and with each other through not just the booky public facing stuff, but the sort of private heartbreaks that, that happen in a life, you know? Um, and there's no me without we, you know? Uh, you know, there's, there's the, that infrastructure has um, been the sort of tectonic bedrock upon which everything else has been built. I'm wondering if there was a turning point for you in your life where you wanted to seek out sobriety. Was there a moment for you that felt like the pinnacle turning moment? Yeah, yeah, I mean, so, you know, I, I, yeah, I mean, I like I had a lot of things that would have qualified as bottoms for most rational people, but I was not a rational person. You know, um, I uh, broke an ankle in a bar fight and then walked home on it. I uh, I just wasn't eating for a time because I was getting all my sustenance through boxed wine and narcotics, and and then I got a vitamin B deficiency that caused my right hand to go, uh, like, paralyzed. Like, I just couldn't move my right hand for a month because the myelin sheaths on my nerves were... You know, all of these things. I shattered my... I, I shared a little bit about this at the high school thing. Um, I shattered my pelvis in a bicycle accident. Um, uh, in driving from or biking from the liquor store, um, I had a handle of whiskey under one arm, and I hit the wrong brakes. I hit the front brakes uh, and went over my handlebar, and naturally, I, you know, I didn't immediately realize that I had shattered my pelvis. I just knew that I couldn't walk, and so I called a friend who put me in the back seat of his car and then carried me up three flights of stairs to my apartment where I finished the whiskey, and, uh, and then the next morning, when I still couldn't walk, um, uh, I called a taxi, I was alone, and I called a taxi, and when the taxi, this was before the ubiquity of Uber and Lyft, um, uh, but uh, I still didn't call an ambulance, but I called a taxi, and, uh, and when she arrived, she called and was like, hey, where are you? And I said, you're gonna have to come upstairs and help me. I can't get down the stairs by myself, which is a really strange thing to ask of a taxi driver. Um, uh, but to my luck, and, and you know, my whole story is this vast conspiracy of minor miracles. Um, if you are theologically inclined, it certainly doesn't disprove that there might be a beneficent hand guiding you know, some of this stuff. But this woman who came up the stairs uh, happened to have two sons with brittle bone disease. Um, and so she, immediately, as soon as she saw me, she was like, you broke your hip. Uh, and I was, I mean, I, did, I had shattered my pelvis, but awfully close still. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, so, she, so she knows exactly how to carry me down the stairs. You know, I'm, I'm a 6'4", 200-ish. Well, I mean, at the time I was probably like 160. But, uh, but uh, yeah, doing a lot of drugs is great if you want to lose weight, by the way. Uh, but, um, but uh, yeah, she helped carry me down the stairs, knew exactly how to hold me and move me into her car. She called ahead to the hospital. They had a, uh, a wheelchair waiting for me. Um, but I share this story mostly to say that when they did the x-rays, uh, you know, the doctor came in and showed me all of the cracks in my pelvis and you could see them without backlight. Um, but, uh, but he also pointed to a fracture in one of my vertebra uh, and he was like, where did, how did the, you didn't tell me about this. And I had no idea. It was a two, it was a two month old fracture and I'd just been walking around with a broken back for two months and I had no idea. Um, and that is, that is, that I feel like that is pretty emblematic of my life at the time, right? Where, you know, I, w I was also selling a lot of drugs and I was really bad at it because I was, I was nice. And so like, I would, I'd be like, hey, come on in. If you, if you ever need anything, just come on in. You know, like I'd leave my doors and windows unlocked. And so I would get robbed and burgled a lot when I was, uh, this is when I was living in Indianapolis. And so, 
Um, uh, yeah, I was just I was just bad at all of it. Um, uh, but anyways, so any of those things, you know, anytime I got robbed or anytime, you know, I shattered my pelvis and had to be bedridden for two months and peeing in bedpan. Sorry, this is graphic, but. Um, uh, you know, that would have alerted a regular sane human being to the severity of the problem at foot, right? Like, that doesn't happen to the sort of person who goes out and has, like, two cocktails on a Friday night, right? Um, but, again, I was not a sane person, so I kept going. And the day that I actually um, finally went to a meeting was just a normal day. It was like I woke up in the morning, and I remember I couldn't find my glasses, uh, and, which was... Normal, like my glasses, my car, and my wallet, like one of the three was always missing. Um, uh, or some, you know, at least one of the three. Uh, and I couldn't find my glasses, and there was this guy that I knew who was a professor at the school where, um, in Indianapolis where I lived, and he had 30 years of sobriety. And I, rem I, I had never known anyone who was sober, and so I was like, he he's an alcoholic, like, that's nuts, you know? Uh, I thought that that meant that his life was in shambles, you know, like me who's pissing the bed every night, you know, um, thought that this 30-year-old guy who's written successful novels and has raised a son and, you know, is a tenured professor at a university and has been sober for 30 years, I was like, this guy must be such a screw-up, you know? Uh, and I finally, and he had long ago invited me to go to a meeting, and I was like, no, I'm not messed up like you, you know? Uh, but uh, I finally agreed to go with him, and so for the first month that I went, again, these were noon meetings, and I would just show up sloshed, um, just sneering, I, I think I, earlier I said like Jane Goodall, like looking at the chimps, you know, uh, like just sort of, it just, uh, you know, the, the utter condescension just oozed from my pores. Um, and, uh, and one day, you know, bumming cigarettes from the men who always gave me cigarettes, um, uh, one of them was like, I bet you couldn't even go one night without drinking. And, um, and, as if to spite him, to prove that I wasn't sick the way that they were all sick. I was like, I'll go one night with it. Yeah, you don't know what you're, you know. Uh, and that night, I lay in bed all night. I obviously didn't sleep at all. The walls were walling at me, the towels were toweling, and uh, I was puking everywhere. I didn't sleep for a second. I was sweating buckets, and I went to the earliest meeting the next day that I could find, which was at 6 a.m., to proudly announce to everyone that I didn't have a problem because I had made it a night without, you know. Um, and, and I've just kept it going. It's an incredible journey <laughs> to, from that to a New York Times best-selling book. It's pretty incredible. I can't help but notice that there's some similarities between Cyrus and yourself in this <laughs> you novel. You picked up on that subtle. Mm, <laughs> subtle cues. <laughs> how, how much of yourself did you feel like you were writing into this character, and did you ever feel like you might be losing part of yourself in writing into this character? Ooh, that second, that second part's, uh, ooh. Um, well, I mean, obviously, you know, I'm yoked to my subjectivity just like anyone, right? I have an unprecedented experience of life here on the planet Earth. I was born in Iran. My first language was Farsi. Um, I quickly learned English shortly thereafter. Um, I prayed in Arabic. We came to America. Uh, we lived in Pennsylvania and then New Jersey and then Milwaukee and you know, like, like the order of my life, there's no human being in the history of humanity that has lived it, right? And so I have this utterly unprecedented humanity. So does everyone else, by the way. I'm not saying I'm so special to have this utterly unprecedented humanity. You all do too. Um, but uh, so I, I'm, I'm living in this unprecedented experience of being alive. And so any time that I shine the prism, shine, language through the prism of that unprecedented experience, it's going to come out in an array that is shaped indelibly by that experience, right? The poet Lee Young Lee says, syntax is identity, right? Which is, have we talked about that? This is, oh, I, I, I thought that smile meant like I had been like, when we were working together, I had been like, oh, Lee Young Lee says syntax is identity. Uh, it's one of my go-to teaching quotes. Um, but uh, I say this to say, you know, I am the, I am indelibly inflected by all of my geographies and all of my histories and all of my genealogies, every book that I've ever read in the order that I read them, every conversation that I've had, you know. Um, and so, you know, if I say, you know, there is a green tree over there, 
even that is inflected by my subjectivity, right? The, the fact that I'm telling you it's green tells you that I'm not fully, I actually am colorblind, but, uh, <laughs> so this is a bad example, but, uh, but it tells you that I'm like sighted, you know, it tells you that I can see, it tells you that I know what a tree is, you know what I mean? Like it, it is still illuminating something about my subjectivity. I say this all to say, um, you know, I, the, the obnoxious answer is that I don't think that anyone has ever written anything that isn't autobiographical. Um, uh, I think that Cyrus and I obviously share certain um, biographical symmetries. He was born in Iran, he was raised here, he's uh, an addict in recovery, um, he uh, is a poet, um, though, again, like he's much earlier in recovery and much newer to poetry, sort of, than I was when I was writing him and am. Um, so there are these biographical symmetries, but they're also a million symmetries, like I think about Orchida, that artist, and I think that we share a lot of really important s symmetries, um, maybe not so sort of s biographically, but um, in terms of the way that we face the world and the way that we think about art um, and legacy and uh, what it takes to make lasting art. Um, I think that I share a lot of symmetries with Z, right? Um, Cyrus is roommate and sometimes lover, who Cyrus often treats like a sort of sidekick um, uh, and whose love Cyrus has real difficulty seeing, certainly accepting. Um, I feel like I've been both sides of that equation at various points in my life, right? Um, the person who couldn't see the love that was being given to me freely and also the person who was giving love freely to someone who couldn't see it, you know? Um, yeah, so I, I say this to say, like, of course Cyrus is me, but I just, turn and face a different lobe of my brain and write Orchida, and then I turn, I face like a different part of my brain and write Arash, you know, and, and um, all of the characters in this book are me, right? I, I, I told my spouse when I finally got the physical copy of the book for the first time, that like, I mean, I mean this absolutely literally, like with the, with the current AI that we have right now, if you just like fed this into it, like whatever came out like if I died tomorrow, like that would still be like 85% of the experience of hanging out with me. Like I really believe that. Like I, like I think that I think that a, you know AI is sufficiently advanced now that you know you might lose like 15% of the sort of strange eccentric uh, associative potential unique to my own psychopathology. But um, but uh, but I think 85% of the experience, like, you know, just stick it in a mannequin and talk to it in the morning over your yogurt, you know? <laughs> Great. I'll let Paige know that you guys approve. There is a really powerful moment in the book for me. And that's when Cyrus is saying that He's American when it suits him, and Iranian also when it suits him. And it's a really interesting thing, the duality of both being Arab and American, or Persian and American. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about, about that experience in the world? Yeah, yeah, I mean, and this is something that I, I definitely know we talked a lot about when, when we were talking about your writing, but um, yeah, I mean, you know, I was born in Iran, but I've spent the vast majority of my life in America. My first language was Farsi, but I'm much more fluent in English, right? So in a room full of Iranians, I feel like the least Iranian person, you know? Um, I can't articulate my thoughts with any sort of clarity um, in Farsi, right? Uh, I can, I know the food words really well. Uh, I can say, you know, I, I can, you know, s say pleasant trees, you know, I can, but, uh, but I can't, you know, communicate with any depth in Farsi. Um, I can actually read it better than I can speak it, and I can speak it better than I can understand it. Um, but, uh, because I can study the reading on my own, whereas I'll never be allowed to go back to Iran in this lifetime. And so, um, yeah, so there is that sense of, you know, I certainly don't feel like the most American person in any room. Um, uh, and so, there's that sense of liminality, but there's also, I mean, you know, in the book uh, orbits a lot of this, but there's also that sense of being Muslim or not Muslim. You know, I, I believe myself to be Muslim, I fast, um, but, you know, I don't think that I live, I, I don't go to Masjid, I, uh, I 
don't live my life in a way that would be legibly Muslim to the vast majority of the world's Muslims, you know? Um, and so, uh, yeah, again, in a room full of Muslims, I feel like the least Muslim person. In a room full of non-Muslims, I certainly don't feel non-Muslim, you know? And so, um, this, th it's, this is everything writ large, right? Um, there's always this sort of liminal position in which I find myself, which is difficult as a human, but great as a writer. Um, uh, because you're sort of always standing on the outside, looking, you know, like when you're inside the cloud, it's hard to describe the cloud, but when you're on the ground, you're like, oh, that's a giraffe, and that's a rhino, and that's a clown. You know, like you can actually see the shape of the cloud, right? With the, that, the, the, the distance. Um, we were, uh, Wordsworth says poetry is emotion recalled in tranquility, right? This he's speaking to a kind of temporal distance, but I think that the sort of social distance that the alterity about which we're speaking provides is also a kind of, a kind of gift. It's a kind of defamiliarist potential. It dehabituates what might feel altogether normal to someone who sits more comfortably within those identity markers. Um, so again, like this is a book that um, has long conversations with Rumi and Ferdowsi and the Shahnameh and Hafez, and, but it also talks about Sonic Youth and EPMD and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and The Simpsons, right? And, so, and this is who I am, right? Like, I, like, these are all, it's not like I have one lobe of my brain for feeling Muslim or for feeling Persian and another for feeling like an addict, and another, you know what I mean? Like, it all just kind of rolls around in there in this gumbo, right? And, and my, to, to make a book sound like my singular unprecedented experience of life on the planet Earth, that all has to feel, that all has to be there. Does that make sense? Absolutely. There's a lot of words in here that English does not offer us. And yeah. maybe I picked up on it as an Arab American reader, but words such as Alhamdulillah or Dejen, or, uh, for example, Roya Jean. Uh -huh. Could you tell us a little bit about the meaning behind Roya Jean or Cyrus Jean, the ending of that? Yeah, I mean, just super, super simply, you know, the Jean is like, uh, like a term of endearment, like, like Kavadir, right? Or, you know, you know it, it's just like a sort of affectionate uh, suffix to add to a word, right, of a beloved. Um, but it's an internet, you know, I have, I have done some translation work, and it is this delicious crisis where, uh, you know, like if in Farsi I wanted to tell you that I miss you, right? The most common, easy, idiomatic way to say that would be de l'ambrat teng shode, right? Which is, it literally translates to, uh, like, my heart tightens for you, right? Like, that's like the literal translation, right? Now, if I'm translating that into English, I could either say, I miss you, and then you lose the heart, right? Or you could say, my heart grows tight for you, and then it becomes like very sort of floral and poetic in a way that it doesn't sound at all in Farsi. Like it's, it's totally, like if I say bless you in English, I'm not actually being like, ooh, like heavens bestow blessings upon you, you know? Uh, but like to, to translate it literally makes it sort of sound, and so like saying my heart grows tight for you, makes it sound very sort of saccharine in a way that it doesn't at all in the Farsi, right? So which do you choose? You can't do like, I miss your heart tight. You, you know, like you can't do half of one, half of the other, right? At some point you have to choose. And I love that. I love that like imprecision of language. I feel like um, those moments where the language just feels so utterly insufficient, those moments where the um, emotional catalytic for the desire to express dwarfs the medium's ability to express it, right? That is, that is all of my favorite art can be thought of as a function of, you know, where are the edges fraying under the magnitude of the catalytic, right? Uh, there's a book by Brian Eno called A Year with Swollen Appendices, um, wherein he's talking about, um, he's talking about listening to blues singers on record, like Billie Holiday, or, Sarah Vaughn or whoever, and um, he describes the sound of their voice cracking on the vinyl as the sound of witnessing emotional events too momentous for the medium assigned to record them. The sound of witnessing emotional events too momentous for the medium assigned to record them, right? 
and he's talking about blues singers on vinyl, but he could be talking about, you know, Coltrane's High C, or he could be talking about, you know, the way that time marbles itself into Sappho, or, um, uh, you know, or, you know, like there's, there's no piece of art that can't be thought of in this way, right? Because you guys know Magritte's Treachery of Images, Cecina Pazin Peep, it's like the picture of the pipe and underneath it, it says, this is not a pipe. Um, uh, you know, a pipe is a piece of carved wood or fiberglass, I don't actually know what pipes are made out of, but, uh, but like a pipe is like a thing into which you put chemically treated plant matter and then you combust it and then you inhale those combusted fumes, right? There's nowhere in the painting to put chemically treated plant matter, right? There's nowhere, there, you know, that you're dissuaded heavily by the museum staff from combusting any part of the painting, right? And so, and so, right, it says Cecina Paz and Beep underneath it. This is not a pipe, right? Um, it is a representation of a pipe, right? And that is, that is true of any art, right? Like the art that I make about my love for my spouse, right? Or about my rage at the Iran Air Flight 655 massacre, or about, you know, justice or about despair or about loneliness or fear of death or joy at my niece's birth, right? Like, it's the art that I make about those things is never going to be equivalent to the experience of the thing itself, right? And so there has to be something in the art that acknowledges that delta, right? That, that is the synapse across which the charge fires and creates illumination, right? That, that, that insufficiency of the medium is the artfulness, right? Um, I don't even remember what your question was. I just, <laughs> I get excited about this stuff. It really matters to me. <laughs> you guys are so nice. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you about Flight 655. How did yeah. you learn about this? Or is this something you knew about? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of the book um, moves into action around, um, in, on July 3rd, 1988. Uh, the USS Vincennes was stationed in the Persian Gulf and shoots a civilian airliner around Air Flight 655 out of the sky. Those of you in the audience of a certain age might remember the Vincennes incident, right? Um, those of you who don't aren't like frantically hurrying to your phones being like, no way that happened and I didn't know about it, right? Like um, 290 people were on board, 66 children, um, all of them were killed, right? Uh, the fact that you know, you kind of have to shuffle through your mental Rolodex of American atrocity to remember which specific American atrocity this was. The fact that if you've never heard of it, you're not like incredulous right now. You're not like, that never, no way, you know, I would have heard about that, right? Is testament to the fact that we kind of just take this as a given, right? We take as a given that the unpleasant but uh, necessary cost of being a military world superpower is that occasionally we're going to shoot a passenger airliner out of the sky, right? Um, we all implicitly understand that, right? Um, and so after it happened, then, pres then Vice President uh, for Reagan, George H.W. Bush, famously says, I don't care what the facts are, I'm not an apologize for America sort of guy. Um, just offering without comment, that was the exact quote, unadulterated. Um, uh, so we have on one side, on the American side, you know, these 290 lives are utterly effaced, right? Um, take a second, you and I can't really see you because of the lighting situation, but take a second and just like think about how, think about your family, think about your family members just right now, like just put their pictures in your head. You know how you love them? That's how those 290 people love their families. You know what I mean? That's exactly the same way they love their families, right? And they were utterly just shot out of the sky um, because of an accident. Uh, they thought it was a fighter plane, even though it wasn't emitting on uh, any sort of military frequency. Anyways, um, on the American side, it's utterly a face. 290. If I said 293, if I said 285, it wouldn't make a difference to you guys, right? Like, it's, it wouldn't make a difference to me. I, I don't mean to put that on you, right? Um, uh, my brain is not equipped to be able to qualitatively feel those quantitative differences, right? Like 290 is a middle large number, it's larger than two, it's smaller than 10,000, right? Um, that feels to me like, not like an ethical failure, but an ethical crisis, certainly, certainly right? And I'm really interested in art's potential to ameliorate that crisis, so, um, 
one life, one life on that flight. Um, the, the book, sort of Cyrus, who you met in those opening pages, is the son of a woman who died on that flight, right? Um, his mother died on that flight. And everything in this book, every character in this book, every action in this book, every song that Cyrus listens to, every person that he sleeps with, every, you know, every place that he goes, every, you know, every one of his lovers has their life indelibly inflected by July 3rd, 1988, right? Every conversation that takes place in this book happens because of what happened on July 3rd, 1988, because of that one person on that flight, right? I think that there is a way in which narrative art can apply the specific granularity of individual narrative to the abstraction of a collective grief, right? So when you are now fully seeing the one out of 290, right? This is just one person. But suddenly you're like, wow, like that one person's life reverberates outwards, you know, for 30 years in all of these ways. And Z, you know, Cyrus's lover, friend, whatever, his life is indelibly shaped by this act, right? Um, when you see those ripples just in this one, one case, and then you're like, and there were 289 other ones of these, right, that created equally large ripples, you know? Um, I think that that is the way into beginning to apprehend with clarity the qualitative loss of 290 lives, right? In the same way that like right now, when I read that 11,500 people have been killed, 11,500 children have been killed in Gaza, right? If that number was 11,505, my brain is not equipped qualitatively to apprehend that difference, right? It is a pulverizingly large number. Um, but when I see a parent talking about you know, their child really loved to play hopscotch or their child really loved to listen to a certain song on the radio. That applies a granular, concrete, qualitative aspect to an utterly incomprehensible abstraction. You see what I'm saying? And then with that laid over, right, now, now multiply that by 11,500, right? Like that is, that is what art can do. That is what narrative art can do, right? And so insofar as I have a kind of, um, insofar as I had a grand ambition for this book, you know, like if people read this book and they're like, man, writing sucks, doesn't know how to make a sentence, but you know, did you know that on July 3rd, 1988, uh, the USS Vincennes shot Iran Air Flight 655 out of the sky? That's a wild success for me, right? Like that is, that is the ethical zenith of my ambitions for this book, right? My vanity wants people to tell me I did a good job and I made a well-made thing, but much, much deeper than that, in the, in the sort of fundament of my person is, is, that, is that sense of like, because this is the technology, you know, I don't know how to write a law. I don't know how to, I, I can barely talk to my accountant, right? Um, but uh, this, is, this is the thing that I can do in this world, right? Um, you know, and it is a channel of my goodness, right? Like I do a lot of other things, but insofar as this has a sort of like public facing utility, um, a sort of high-minded purpose. That's the zenith of it. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> so I'm gonna shift to something a little uh, more personal. <laughs> okay, more <laughs> personal than that. I feel like I gotta like, yeah, okay, all right. But I'm gonna throw you a curveball here. I love it, love a curveball. <laughs> so I know you just recently got a dog about oh, a yes, year ago. Yes, yes. Um, how has that changed or heightened your writing process? Oh, this rules, I love this. Um, okay, so yeah, I, we have three cats and um, yeah, a little over a year ago, a year and a few months ago, um, we heard about this I, I promise that it's not like a relentlessly sad book and like, it, like I am not a relentlessly sad person. I feel like I'm like getting heavier with you guys than I mean to, but I really care about this. Like I genuinely care about this stuff. Um, uh, but yeah, so like a year and a few months ago, we heard about this dying farmer in Missouri who um, had this puppy who uh, he couldn't take care of. He, he had lost a lot of his mobility and so he could only let him out of the crate every few days, right? And so we were like, we have room for a tiny puppy. Uh, <laughs> little did we know, but, um, and I've never had a dog before. I've, I've, 
didn't grow up around dogs. I've never really spent time around dogs. Um, and so I was like, surely this tiny puppy will get along famously with our three cats. He's even smaller than them. Like, what could go wrong? Uh, and so we drive down to Missouri and we get this puppy. Um, we name him Galilee, uh, which is, I, I feel great about that name. Uh, I, I just, I, uh, I won't, I, I don't do a lot of patting myself on the back in this world, or I try not to, but uh, I really feel great about that name. It's a sea in Northern Palestine. I'm no flavor of Christian. I've never been any sort of Christian, but, um, but I do love the Bible. I just, I like reading the Bible. I think it's, I make my students memorize the Psalms to work on their ear. You know, I, I, it, that is the bedrock upon which the contemporary, contemporary sonic English was built, um, David's music. And, um, but there's a story in the Bible about, um, some of you probably know what I'm sure about, uh, Jesus and the Sea of Galilee, um, which is the sea in northern Palestine. And um, he's, on, he's on a boat with his, with his compatriots, his pals. Uh, you may have heard of them. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and there's like this, ra he's taking a nap, you know, he's getting some shut-eye, and his pals are freaking out. There's this raging storm around them. And they wake him up, and they're like, yo, you gotta, you gotta help us out, like, this is nuts. And I think that's a quote. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and he wakes up groggy. This is one of my favorite parts, like one of my favorite Jesus lines. And he's just like, oh, why, do you have, why do you have so little faith? Like he's just like, Ugh, like what? You know, like with that exasperated, you know, he loves these people, but he's so annoyed to have been woken up from his nap, you know? And, uh, and he's like, why do, you, why do you have so little faith? And he's, he's calms the Sea of Galilee, like he calms the storm, but then he keeps berating them. And it's just like, it, it just reminds me so much of like having guests over and they wake you up for the like Wi-Fi password or something. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like that sort of like, oh, I love you, but you're being a, it, you know, it's like that sort of feeling, right? And uh, it's, it's just like, oh, you think this is how I go out? Like, you think this is how my dad takes me out? Is like just randomly on this like little journey across this relatively small seat, you know? Um, and uh, I just, I loved that moment forever. And so I, yeah, I, I named him Galilee. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, it also just tastes good, doesn't it? Like Galilee, like it's just, it's just like a little like tic-tac of pleasure every time you say it. Um, and yeah, he's just, he's just my guy. He's just like, I, there's, never, there's never been a day of his life when I've been home that I haven't taken him to the dog park. Um, it is now much more for me than it is for him. Um, uh, and I just walk around for like two hours. That's like, I, I, I take my calls there. I meet with students on Zoom as I'm walking around. Like it's just, um, it's just my spot. Like it's like some people do Sudoku or crossword puzzles or yoga or whatever. And I walk around the dog park with Galilee. He's my guy. Um, again, unless I'm teaching or traveling, uh, he's never more than 10 feet away from me. Um, he's a border collie blue healer mix. Uh, he's like white with, yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> he's like white with little blue spots. I, he's just, you know, I'm, there's no, there's no one, there's no sentient being in the universe more spoiled than the single dog of a childless couple. Um, and, 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 uh, he's just, he's just my guy, like truly. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> uh, I'll let Galilee know he got over a round of applause in Traverse City. That's good. So it looks like we got time for one more for me at least. Okay. Um, the next question is at the end, and I don't want to give away anything about the end. Okay. But there's a moment where Cyrus says he's stepping into love, yeah. stepping into that choice, maybe. Can you tell us a little bit about, about that choice in the end, to step into love? Yeah, it's... I. You never have to worry about spoiling a poem, you know, like, you, you never have to be like, the last line was the moon, you know, or what, you know, like, uh, but this is definitely a spoilable book. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it can be really difficult to accept the love that is given to you freely, whether that be interpersonal or romantic or cosmic or whatever. Um, I think it can be really difficult, uh, let me speak in the first person singular. I 
uh, have often thought to myself, I don't deserve this. Um, that thought I have found to be rooted in a kind of hubristic sense that I know what I deserve better than the universe that is giving it to me freely, right? Um, that, you know, if I am saying I don't deserve this, then I'm also tacitly implying that the universe that dwarfs me in every sense of scale um, uh, knows less than I do. And like, I'm abundantly aware of like how fallible my brain is, right? And so, um, that has, you know, that clarity is horizontal, like the horizon, I'll march towards it forever and I'll never actually get there, but I think that the marching, the motion is what keeps me good and, or good adjacent, you know. Uh, I think it keeps me trying to wake up each day and move through the world, harming it a little less than I did the day before. Um, and, and yeah, and I think a big part of that is ego, and a big part of that is um, assenting to the will of, again, I'm not offended if you call it God, you can call it the universe, you can call it fate, you can call it life choices, higher power, whatever, you know, it's all equally imprecise, it's language, it's like, it's, it's a human technology thrown on a great ineffable. Um, and so it's all, equally imprecise and I'm no more offended by, well, anyways, uh, I think that Cyrus's experience runs pretty parallel to that. Um, I think this is the time that we turn to our uh, new friends in the audience um, and in, if you guys have any Questions, comments? Oh, look at how many of you there are. Oh, that's amazing. Hey, Matt Post. Uh, hey, who is that back there? Is it, are you waving at me or at Ari? Oh, okay. Oh, you're just waving. You're a good-natured human being. I thought that's I didn't my know. partner. Okay. Cool. Um, cool. Uh, uh, you said go. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm supposed to direct you to go to these mics that are prominently um, uh, set up. And thank you. Um, Joe, Josh, and Sean for making all the bloopy blips uh, run on time. Can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> and everyone, everyone who has made this evening possible, I've been taken extraordinarily well, good, well care of? Good care of. I've, they've taken extraordinarily good care of me. All right, well, I'll try for a Amazing, question. what's your name? Uh, my name is Karen. Karen, it's nice to meet I you, I'm Kaveh. I loved the book. I oh, loved you read it already? Yes. Oh, wow, yes. that rules, yeah. thank you so much. And, that means and so I, I realized that there is a spoiler thing, and so I'm gonna try to ask yeah. the question and then try not to spoil it. Sure, yeah. sure. So, um, I mean, I, just, I know what happens. They're the ones who will be mad at you. Right, right, well, and, and for people, I, it really is a page turner. I mean, you, you want to get to the end. I, I think appreciate it's incredibly that. well. It's a narrative, as you learned a lot from all your daily work. Yeah. Anyway, truly kleptomaniacal, it's, it's you know, just like grabbing yeah. from everyone's brains. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering, when you think about Tehran, um, do you think that this book will uh, be published in Iran? And what do you think in Iran would be the most controversial parts? of the book, and I'm thinking specifically um, something we haven't talked tonight is kind of the uh, gender identity yeah. issues, um, and you know, is that particularly sensitive uh, in Iran, um, you know, or are there other parts of the book that you think, wow, that, that is why they wouldn't publish it, or, or will they publish it? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Karen, and thank you for spending that time with the book, too. It's not a small gift, uh, the, again, the, Time is your most irreplenishable resource. You can make more money, right? But you can't make more time. So it's not lost on me that you've given me a great gift. Um, it means we've spent a lot of time together. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, this is an infinitely complicated question. My first book of poetry was published in Iran. Um, it was com a completely an addiction recovery narrative. Um, so every time I mentioned a drug or alcohol, they translated it out, which made no, it was like this weird, like, uh, like almost unreadable doc. Like it was, it was almost like an art piece in and of itself. Like about, yeah, about like erasure and censorship. You know, um, like kind of fascinating. And it was like I spoke to the translator, and she was like, I don't know, I did what I could. You know, and uh, 
so yeah, I don't think that this one will be, but it's also, I feel like I have to say in this moment that, you know, we all are aware of the sort of necrotheological regime that is in place there and has been since 1979, but that didn't just happen due to the inherent barbarism of the Persian people, you know what I mean? Bar Barbar, bar, that's a funny word, etymologically, barbarism comes from uh, the Greek soldiers used to make fun of the Persians by saying their language sounded like bar, 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 right? And so this is the etymological root of the word barbarian. Anyways, um, the, uh, yeah, so, you know, the 1979 revolution happens because the Shah wanted to privatize the oil, which at that point, 97% of the profits from which were going to the UK. Um, obviously, the UK didn't want that to happen, right? And so the MI6, and this, as soon as I start talking about the CIA and the MI6, it sounds like I'm like wearing a tinfoil hat, but this is absolutely what happened, right? Um, the MI6 and the CIA um, arm these sort of like anarcho-revolutionists in, uh, in Iran, many of whom were actually like utterly secular and were like total leftist socialist revolutionaries um, uh, to overthrow the Shah, who wasn't a good guy either, but you know. Um, uh, and they do, but then in the power vacuum that emerges, there was no, you know, there was the, there was the you know, revolutions come in two parts, right? There's the overthrow and the rebuild. There was no plan for a rebuild, right? They just, and so in the power vacuum that resulted, you know, again, these sort of necro-fascist theologian, you know, uh, these guys took all the guns and the tanks and they were like, all right, well, I guess we'll run this if no one else is going to, you know? Um, and we are now living in the legacy of that, right? And so, um, the Iran-Iraq war emerges out of that, right? Saddam goes in and invades because he thinks Iran is weak, Iran is offended by it, so they keep the war going far longer than they need to. Um, I say all this to say, uh, you know, the, the state of things there is not like these inherently barbarian Iranians who wouldn't be able to appreciate great literature. Like I have copies of Dubliners in Farsi that were translated there pre-revolution and you know, I mean the Rolling Stones and the Beatles would tour through Tehran, you know, like it was um, And I don't mean to paint this picture of like it used to be this like halcyon, you know, sort of state of perfection either, but um, What what exists there now is not just the inexorable um, arc of all Middle Eastern nations, you know, devolving into, you know, murderous theology, right? It is the direct result of Western powers intervening in toppling democratic regimes, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so I, I say this to say, right, like, the contemporary valences of this are a little chilling, right, you know, given what we all see on the nightly news right, right now, you know? So that's important for me to say, too. I don't want to just be like, oh, those... Iranian Philistines wouldn't know what to do with my novel, you know, like they would, they absolutely would. It's just like a hand, like a tiny percentage of a percentage um, sat at the top who control all the guns and the weapons who, you know. Okay, we have a question from our live stream audience. Oh, amazing. I forgot. Hey, live stream audience. Thank you so much for being here. I hope that... 93 people on our live stream Amazing. Tonight. Shout out all 93 of you. I hope all of our paths bend across corporeally someday. This is from Susan Odgers, a wonderful supporter and a guest, former guest host of NWS. She says, welcome from Michigan Writers. She's also a part of Michigan Writers. During the pandemic, we sought out poets. Can you talk about this and their role now? Mm. Yeah, thank you for that question, Susan. I appreciate it, and I appreciate your being here. Um, you know, I just put together this anthology um, called The Penguin Book of Spiritual Verse, um, and so the vast majority of my reading, my pleasure reading for the last, aside from the two novels a week, I, when I re pleasure read poetry, it's largely been poetry of antiquity, you know, um, Aboriginal Antipodian poetry or indigenous Mesoamerican poetry or Sub-Saharan African poetry or, you know, the Greeks whose names you all know and, you know, uh, all of these, all of these poetries um, uh, about which I knew relatively little compared to the European canon. Um, and, and the great lesson from all of that has just been utter humility. Right, it's just been this sense of having been utterly precedented in my thinking by 
a million billion times over, right? Um, I was, I can't remember who I was talking, I was talking to someone about this today, it might have been Doug. Um, but, uh, you know, the earliest, attributable, the earliest attributable author in human literature is Enhedwana, who is a Sumerian priestess, the daughter of King Sargon, who ruled over the city-state of Ur. You Mesopotamia heads might recognize the name Sargon. Um, but uh, but uh, she was his daughter and she wrote these beautiful hymns to the goddess Inanna, who also, if you've read Gilgamesh, you know, he, she shows up prominently in that. And, um, and in the Bhagavad Gita. Um, uh, her hymns, though, at some point in her life, after Sargon dies and his son takes over, she's exiled, right? So she's writing a lot of her poems from exile, like Ovid or, um, you know, Hikmet, I guess, or Darvush. Uh, and she's, she's writing all of these poems from exile. And so there's these utterly uncanny reverberations of like contemporary immigrant crises, right? And refugee crises in her writing, right? Um, you're reading these poems from a woman who lived 4,300 years ago, and she's talking about like immigration reform. She says, um, now I have been, there's a line in one of her hymns, um, now I have been cast out to the place of lepers. Uh, earlier in that poem, she also says, um, talking to Inanna, she says, in your thunder, nothing green could live, which could be talking about Monsanto as readily as it could be talking about Inanna, right? Or, um, you know, Exxon that puts 70 million tons of carbon into the atmosphere every year. Um, in your thunder, nothing green could live. And the end of that poem, uh, that specific hymn to Inanna, she ends, um, my beautiful mouth knows only confusion, even my sex is dust. And just like the, just like landing in that place of complete uncertainty, my beautiful mouth knows only confusion, even my sex is dust. This is the earliest attributable author of our species, right? And to think that we somehow in the quarantine or post-quarantine um, have landed upon something that she couldn't figure out, or Dante couldn't figure out, or Hafez, or Lipo, or Rapia, or Mahadevyaka, or Patakara, or, you know, it, it just, I feel very humble, you know, I, I'm a guy who's alive in Iowa City, and it feels to me like a great privilege to whisper into this conversation that has preceded me by millennia and will continue long after the last person forgets my name. All right, I have another question that was actually texted to me from a friend in Denver. Lindsay Sandham says, what's next? <laughs> uh, thanks, Lindsay, great question. Uh, I wish I could offer, my spouse would also like to know. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm in this sort of amazing period where, you know, I worked on this novel as sort of my full-time job for five, well, you know, I had a few other full-time jobs, but, um, uh, you know, this was the thing that I did, you know, if I wasn't actively teaching or, you know, a big part of my life is working with fellows in recovery. Um, if, I, if I wasn't doing one of those two things, I could pretty reliably be expected to be found working on this somewhere, right, um, in some capacity. Uh, and now, just in the past couple of weeks, I'm sort of in this funny position of being secretary to the work or midwife or doula or whatever you want to call it, right? Like, uh, like I'm sort of running it around and um, meeting, hopefully helping it find the people for whom it might be useful. Um, and that's thrilling, but it's also like, I want to be careful how I say this, but eh, it's like, I, I'm an addict, right? Like, and the, of the highs left to me today, I have basically have caffeine and having written. You know, um, and <laughs> and I've lost my privilege to all the other ones, and uh, and and having written is really like that's the money one. You know, like I that I live for that, right? Like I I I get higher off that than any. You know, I can if I write a thousand words in the morning, you know, I can get into a fight with my spouse, and I can get a nasty email from my chair, and I can get a flat tire, and like you still can't tell me shit, you know what I mean? Like, I'm just like, I'm just like, I'm just so, I'm like hovering six inches off the ground still, you know what I mean? Um, and so the writing, the writing of it, the writing of it, I, I write everything by hand, so it's just like the kinetic 
drafting of it, right, is just like, that's what I live, I'm getting goosebumps talking about it. Like, I, like, that's what I live for, right? Like, that is the pleasure button that I'm still allowed to press as much as I want today, right? So I'm really eager to get back to that. Um, I love, the, I, like, I love, obviously, I love a captive audience, as I'm sure that you guys have noticed. And, um, you know, I love to sort of soliloquize and rhapsodize about the stuff that I care deeply about. Um, but, but this is like, this is, everything else is kind of gravy, you know? It's lovely, but I can take it or leave it. Whereas, like, this, this is like the, that's what I, so, you know, I have, I, I, mostly over the past few years, I've been writing little love poems for my spouse, and, uh, and that's like the, you know, I certainly have a book's worth of them. I, I write a lot more than I ever publish. Um, uh, and they're the sort of thing where I'll spend two hours working on a poem someday as a way to procrastinate doing whatever chore I'm actually supposed to be doing. Um, and so I'll do that and give it to them, and they'll be like, that's lovely, Kave, but you still need to clean the litter or whatever, you know? And uh, so... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the next thing will be. I, I, but yeah, it'll be something. <laughs> hey. Hi, <laughs> my name's Claire, and I work Claire. with people in recovery. And you may have Wait, just. Wait, what did you? What did you just say? I work with people who. Oh, are in cool, recovery. cool. Thank you for doing that. So I love such may... people. <laughs> well, we try. Um, so you may have already answered the question in a way, but. Um, one of the things that breaks my heart is people who are struggling with addictions who have difficulty in forgiving themselves sure. and moving forward. Yeah. Just wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, well, I guess the baldest way I can say it is that I've been the beneficiary of a, a program of recovery that um, has preceded me by a hundred years and has helped a lot of people and um, I didn't try to reinvent the wheel I just sort of went through that program um, again and again and again with people who had already been through it and I'm not going to say the name of the program uh, because I think this is being recorded but I imagine most of you can guess which one it is right. um, and uh, and uh, so that helps obviously you know uh, uh, that's not a new problem for any of us um, what I will also say is that in the rooms, the worst stuff that you ever did is still something that someone else has done, you know? Um, and you see them being, you know, fixing a 67 Camaro with their son, or you see them, you know, coaching the volleyball team, and you're like, oh, I can still be, I can still be useful even having done, you know? I think that we live, if you will allow me to zoom out a little bit, yeah. um, I think that we're in a kind of funny moment of um, rhetorical hygienics that lead to a sort of ethical obviousness um, in contemporary art and contemporary discourse, right? I mean, the, the dominant place where contemporary discourse happens is social media, right? And there is always a sort of, you know, uh, universally agreed upon like left decision or a left stand on any issue and a universally agreed upon right decision or stance on any issue and any sort of deviation even however cursory um, is marked as you know um, there's a lot of flattening people to the most grotesque artifact of their living right um, and you know, I've spent a decade taking meetings into carceral institutions and rehab facilities and halfway houses and some of the people found themselves in those spaces because they accidentally got pulled over with an eighth of weed, but some of them did some really, really vile shit, you know? Um, some of them did some really, really awful harm to people. And I've never found one of them not worthy of recovery, you know? I've never met a person who didn't deserve to experience joy at any point in their life, you know? And so, I don't know, I, I have a lot of trouble reconciling myself with the sort of like pop ethical moment. Um, uh, I believe in rehabilitation, absolutely, without qualification, I believe in rehabilitation. Um, there's no except for, there's no, you know, but what ifs, you know, I, I believe in rehabilitation. Um, and again, I keep it simple. Hi. What's your name? Maggie. Maggie. I like that name. It's nice Thank to meet you. you. Um, so identity is obviously a major part of your story. I read it, and I really. Oh, you read it. it. I read we it. spent a lot of time together. I Thank you, Maggie. It this morning. Oh no way. 
Yes. Wait, did we already talk out there? No, no. we didn't. Oh, amazing. No. Great. Thank you for that. Yeah. Someone else just finished it this morning. I was like, wow, that's amazing. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to see how it ended. Um, but so your story concerns identity, obviously, on many levels as an American, Iranian addict. Um, and Cyrus considers himself an orphan in mm -hmm. the story. And death is obviously a major theme. This is personal, but do you consider yourself an orphan and able to speak from that point of view? Yeah, um, yeah, I, yeah, you can't always draw on experience for content. You know, I, I experience is a finite reservoir. I mean, it's a deep reservoir, but it is, you will eventually hit the bottom. So at some point you do have to turn to language or to imagination. No, both of my parent, both of my literal parents are literally alive. Um, uh, my, my biographical parents are both literally alive. Um, uh, yeah, I don't want to say too much more about that uh, in a public forum, but they're both literally alive. Um, uh, what I can offer is that, yeah, I mean, Cyrus, you know, Cyrus is queerish. He's orphaned, you know, his, his, you guys, I've shared about how his mother died on the flight. His dad comes to America and spends uh, 20 years working on an industrial duck farm, or chicken farm. My actual dad worked on an industrial duck farm. I, <laughs> um, not that, again, not to put a sort of autobiographical thumb on the scale, but, um, but uh, yeah, my actual dad came to America and worked on duck farms for 25 years. Um, my Cyrus's dad works on chicken farms, though, so totally not biographical. Um, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I you know the experience of being adrift, um, the experience of believing that you can only shape meaning in relation to other people, and feeling that you have no other people against which to bounce the foil of to bounce the foil of your person um, is certainly something to which I can relate and I think that um, but again you know it's it's a book of fiction thank you thank you hi what's your name Hi, I'm short. <laughs> I'm Annie. Annie, it's nice to meet you. Good to meet you. Do you like you how I didn't do the dad joke thing of being like, "Hi, short. It's nice to meet you." <laughs> I know that every yeah, I do in like my that. Mind inspiring <laughs> to do that, and I resisted it. So, when you were talking about the Vincennes story and writing it into Martyr, mm -hmm. it seemed very intentional. You wanted people to recognize that and and the ripple effect of those 290 yeah. lives lost. Was that the a through line of the story, do you think, I have multiple questions here, was that a through line? Do you think it's easier to do something like that with narrative writing than with poetry? And are you, have you ever tried something, your first book of poetry was about recovery. Yeah. So is that kind of a step in that direction that led you to where you are now? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, thank you for that question. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I, it's definitely a through line. I mean, it's definitely one of the sort of arteries that, um, uh, carries life throughout the book. And in fact, there are, um, sections of ex real, like sections of real excerpts from the New York Times talking about the event. Um, the cover of Newsweek, the week after it happened, uh, said, Gulf tragedy in big letters, and then had an op-ed from Henry Kissinger about what to do about Iran. Um, I have the, I have, I got an issue, which is funny because a couple years, funny the way that crows are funny birds, not funny, haha. -ha, but um, funny because like a couple years before that, there was an incident where um, a Russian naval aircraft accidentally shoots down a Korean airliner. And the some of you are nodding along like you remember that. And and the the cover of that Newsweek said, uh, "Murder in the air," right? So when it's Korea doing it, or I'm sorry, when it's Russia doing it to Korea, it's murder in the air. When it's America doing it to Iran, it's Gulf tragedy, right? I, I like. It, uh, that was originally in the book, and I took it out because it seems so obvious that it was kind of artless, you know? Um, uh, like, it's the sort of thing that's interesting to share like this, but maybe is just a little bit too thumb on the scale-y for a book of fiction. Um, 
but uh, yeah, so um, to answer your second question about whether or not poetry can, yeah, I mean, recovery is a pretty broad through line relative to like a specific act of empirical violence. Um, but there are plenty of collections of poetry organized around such acts, right? Um, M. Norbessa Philip is a Trinidadian Canadian poet who has a great book called Song um, orbiting a court trial around um, a slave ship that threw uh, enslaved Africans overboard to claim the insurance money and the entire book draws from uh, court documents about whether or not the insurance should honor the claim, right? Uh, which is, I mean, every, every part of that conceit is chilling, right? Um, but uh, so there are, there, are, there are truly, truly great works of poetry. That poet again is M. Norbese, N-O-U-R-B-E-S-E, Philip, uh, I think one L. Um, and the book is called Zong, Z-O-N-G. Um, if you want to check that out, but uh, you know, there are like I don't I don't think of mine as one of those books. I think of mine as more a kind of like here are forty poems and I you know put a title on it sort of books, right? Um, which is also a great way to do a book. I mean, that's a viable way to make a poetry book. But um, uh, yeah, there are really really artful. You know, Solmaz Sharif has a book called Look that uh, that also kind of works in more the way that you're describing. So. Hi, friend. What's your name? Hello, I'm Beth. Beth, Hi. nice to yeah. meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Um, we had an author here for the writer series a few months ago, V.E. Schwab, and she was a queer author writing queer characters, and she was talking about her frustration of wanting to make queer characters who were multidimensional, who were villains, who were flawed, but feeling like she had to platform them and sort of make them into saints. Yeah. And I was really curious, like your take writing an Iranian character, if you had any pressure either internally or externally of like having to do that same thing to like make it palatable or representative to an American audience. Yeah, 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 thank you, Beth. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, you know, uh, I don't know, <laughs> in life or, I mean, I don't wanna get really blue, but like, I don't know what the quantitative metric is to qualify for queerness, but I certainly think that if it is just based in like X number of sex acts, um, uh, Cyrus qualifies in the book, but he doesn't sit comfortably within that identity, right? Um, and uh, with regard to the other pieces of his identity, right? I, I, I don't think that, again, like there's a kind of, if you'll indulge me for a second, I'm gonna zoom out, but I promise I'm gonna land this plane. Um, the, poor choice of words. But, um, but uh, the, the, the first Sam Raimi Spider-Man film, the first Lord of the Rings movie, and the first Harry Potter movie all premiere within a year of 9-11, 2001, right? Um, there is a way in which American culture for the past two decades, the predominant cultural product of our generation is the Marvel movie, right? Like that is what we have given to the world in the same way the Western, you know, the John Ford Western used to be in the same way the sort of um, grimy detective story was a little bit after that, right? Right now, or for the past 20 years, it's been the Marvel movie, right? Um, there is a, re I don't know anything about Marvel, so I apologize to any, but like, uh, but like, you know, there is this, barrel-chested good guy in New York City who is a paragon of virtue, and then Thanos comes in from the moon and disrupts the status quo, and, and Captain America punches him back to the moon, right? And, and then we get to go back to the status quo, and everyone is, you know, I, I know that that's, I know that the Marvel movies are a little bit more complicated than that, but not much, ethically. Uh, and, and I say this to say, you know, that is, that is both a really, really ethically infantilized version of eth the, the ethics in which we find ourselves. It's the sort of story that is made for like a seven-year-old to begin to understand ideas, but not m for any sort of like complicated thinking adult human being, right? Um, and yet, we, we had this sort of like pacification after the complexity of being attacked and we didn't really understand why, it, you know, our president was telling us it was because they hated our freedom, which even, you know, the most sort of whatever, like that we, I think everyone kind of, was like, that doesn't make a ton of sense, you know? Um, and, and so there's a reason that we turn to the Harry Potter and the Lord of the Rings where there's like the blinking evil eye on the volcano and the orcs like clashing their sabers or whatever, right? Um, there's a reason that we find such solace in these and that they govern us culturally for the next 20 years, right? That 
ethical infantilization, though, has seeped into uh, has seeped into high art, right? Uh, I think that if you look at now, I'm gonna get like really spicy, um, but like uh, if you look at like a lot of the most zeitgeisty contemporary fiction and poetry. It, it, it is dazzling in a number of ways, but ethical complexity doesn't tend to be one of them. Um, uh, and and as as a human being, like just my singular sort of like aesthetic, psycho spiritual loadout, like that is what feeds me the most, right? That is what you know. There is a those of you who have read The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. There's a scene in that book where, um, and this is a difficult scene, but. Um, there's a scene in that, but it's a difficult reality. Um, there's a scene in that book where Charlie Breedlove, who is in many ways the villain of the book, um, Piccolo Breedlove's dad, uh, they flash to his childhood, and he's in the woods, and he's losing his virginity with a, with a young woman, and he's a teenager, and this pickup truck comes and shines its lights on them and there are these white guys in the pickup truck and they say, keep going, keep going, right? And like they're sort of making a spectacle of these two young black Americans, right? And Morrison writes, oh my God, I'm getting like goosebumps just thinking about it. Um, and I'm not gonna do justice to the language. I'm not gonna try to like summon it verbatim, but it's something to the effect of uh, he couldn't hate himself because no man truly hates himself. And he couldn't hate them because he knew that was a hate that would destroy him. And so he hated her, right? And that's the origin, you know, and those of you who have read The Bluest Eye know, you know, he's horribly misogynist and just a bad guy, but he's not a like mustache twirling villain who just wants to see the world explode, right? Because of the power rings or whatever, you know, he, the, the, the circ it's like that, what we were talking about or about Iran, right? It's not just like these are these inherently like dumbass, like, you know, clerics who just don't know any better, right? It's like this was landed upon by a certain set of factors that conspired against, you know, autonomous, uh, you see what I'm saying? And so I say all of this, all of this to say, this very long sort of protracted meta conversation to say, um, I don't, I, I think I actively don't want anyone in my book to feel aspirational. I don't think that there is a character in the book who behaves uh, fully ethically, hygienically, uh, or who, you know, Cyrus is constantly um, lashing out at the people around him and speaking cruelly and um, uh, being negligent of other people's interiorities. And, and I love him, you know, I love him so much. And I hope that you guys will too when you read it because he, it, like that is, that is, the moral reality that I have known is like me seeing another person in their fullness and loving them because of those things, you know, loving them because of those human moments, not, the, again, not the barrel-chested Captain America. Also, I mean, just to be a little twee about it, the idea of an interloper coming to Earth to disrupt the status quo and then being punched back to the moon or whatever and, you know, and that sort of valorization of the status quo is a fundamentally regressive position, right? That's a fundamentally conservative position, right? To say like, ooh, yeah, like we want to get back to the status quo, get, get these chaos ag agents out of here is a fundamentally conservative position, right? That's make America great again, right? Um, and, you know, I don't want to, you know, I whatever, I, I don't know you guys, but, uh, but that's a fun, you know, and so I don't think it's an utter coincidence, I don't, I, I, it's like a chicken and egg thing, but I don't think it's a coincidence that this is the dominant cultural product of our era. This is, this is what, you know, how many times have your kids seen the Avengers, no, I don't mean yours, the royal you, kids seen the Avengers movies, right? Um, uh, I don't think that it's a coincidence that we find ourselves in this era of make America great again and the valorization of like a non-existent status quo that never was, right? Um, uh, and you know these chaos agents, these like these rapscallions taking to the streets to demand equity and you know to demand an end to genocide, et cetera. You know, like they must be punched to the moon. You, you see what I'm saying, right? Um, it's all connected and it's all messy and interlocked in these ways that I think it would be ethically irresponsible for me as an artist to try to flatten into some sort of parable, you know, to some sort of like ethics fable.
Uh, does, does this mean that I need to stop talking? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not being very subtle about it, but I just want to be clear. We just had one more question from the live stream audience. Oh, amazing. If, if, oh, I... Oh, I, sorry, come on. And oh, amazing. Well, let's, let's end with, with him because we have run out of time. Okay, okay cool, yeah. cool. Hey. Hey, Chitori. Salam. Uh, <laughs> Chitori. Um, oh, man. You see this, how we have, like, Iranian sonar? I don't know, I don't know this person. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is, like, chilling yeah. for me. So, my name is Cyrus. Oh, no way! <laughs> yeah, way. Yeah, way. <laughs> <Kurush> baba! <laughs> for everything you've done. Yeah. Um, the, my nephew's name is Kaveh. He is in film school in UCLA. I mean, <laughs> so rules. he's an artist. He's the one who bucked the trend of, you know, medicine. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That was me. I was like, I was like totally groomed to be a stereotypical Middle Eastern mathy science boy. Right? And then I discovered drugs and poetry. You know, <laughs> as you do, I, I, I found myself in medicine and I, that was a struggle in some ways because I really, a bit of an artist, uh, like to write and read and music so yes. thank you for embodying you know that other part of you know our people and our culture that gets lost um, and just a lot of gratitude for putting something out there that that um, humanizes in all the various ways um, our folks our people um, and uh, it's very weird seeing my name in a book. <laughs> You're gonna see it a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, no, I'm, I'm a few chapters in. It's very, yeah, it's yeah, very yeah. peculiar. And You're also, like, like <laughs> it turns out, yeah. um, I, all I have is, is just, just gratitude for, for doing what you, what, making what you've made, um, and uh, to share, you know, things that maybe are a little bit um, deficient in some parts of our, our relational culture. Uh, yeah, even, I'm, I'm proud of you for doing this. Kaylee, Kaylee, Mamuna. Hey, mom. Yeah, I thank you. I appreciate it. There's a my impulse is to be immediately be like no 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 no. Uh, which is yeah, well tarot. So so in 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 Persian culture, there's this thing called tarot, which is like this elaborate etiquette dance that you do. So like someone comes over to your house and they bring you a bowl of fruit, and you say no 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 no, you know, and and you're like yes 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 please please please, and you're like no 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 no, you know, and like it's this, but for everything, it's for the old joke is that two Iranian men can never get on an elevator because they'll keep saying after you after you after you after you, and the doors will open and close, right? Uh, and so you know. Actually, one of my favorite, maybe we can end on this, one of my favorite words in any language, so in Farsi, um, you negate a word by saying B in front of it, so, so like uh, an A, like, uh, like an atheist is a non-theist, right? Like uh, asphyxiate is, you know, to, w w you understand how English works. Um, uh, and B is that in Farsi. Um, so taraf is this elaborate etiquette dance, but if you're with like a real beloved, um, like if I'm with my brother and I just grab the check uh, and he does the whole, uh, you know, uh, I can be like, beat her off, beat her off, you know, like just like let's skip the bullshit, right? Like we're fine, like we don't need to do all that. And that's one of my, it's utterly untranslatable, right? There's no English equivalent of that at all. But I love that so much, like that sentiment when you're with someone, where you're intimate enough to just say like, beat her off, beat her off, we can skip that, like we're, we, we don't need to do all that, right? But, you know, the real insidious part of that though is that some people will try to tar off you by saying beat her off, you know, like they'll be like, they'll like try to pick up the check and it's like I don't know them that well and they're like oh beat her off Kave, beat her off and I'm like no like just, you know and then like part of the tar off is like negating their beat her off you know it but like so like I know I know it is exhausting to be Persian in this specific way but uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you said what yeah, yeah, yeah. That, well, and actually, I talk about that in it, like, not to, like, be like, oh, you should go all read this book, but, like, uh, there are lots of good books to read, but, um, but I do talk about that in this, how, like, uh, Persian Taraf and, like, Midwestern, like, pathological politeness kind of collide, right, you know, and, and it's just, like, this, like, flinching thing where you're just wearing lesions into your brain, you know, and, uh, yeah, so <laughs> hopefully that's a good sell. Thank you all so much for being here. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Kava. Thank you, Ari.
Thank you. So Hi, Beth. You can meet Kava and Ari out in the lobby where they'll be signing books. And thank you again. Thank you for joining us. Up next is our Twin Flames event, featuring a cult expert and survivor on February 22nd at the City Opera House and live streamed.